Ian, you are currently preparing the performance of Case Text Paradise, um, a new version of the Miss of Philoctetes. And we are very grateful uh, that you both agreed to talk to us in this context, knowing how busy you are and how complicated it can be to talk about a work in progress. So thank you first. And to start this discussion, can you both tell us about this collaboration between you two? How did it start and how is it going now that the rehearsal process is um, about to start or in between two kind of sessions? Well, Philoctetes is a play that many directors have a secret love of, but very few ever do it. And there are reasons for that that we could talk about. But the spur for me was my own mini trauma. I was living high life. I had a play on in New York. I had Electra by Sophocles on in London. I felt invincible. I decided to go running really fast. I even had Kay's work on the headphones. I got hit by a bike. I was running by the river. I, I felt this hubristic moment. And I ended up in intensive care with a brain bleed, a fractured skull, lacerated kidneys. I came out five days later and put the play on on Broadway, came home and had a massive crash lost my sense of smell, which has still not really come back, and dismantled my career. I thought, why am I doing all these big shows? And I was doing some television, and I suddenly thought, I want to work much smaller and in a more holistic way. And so I did a project with refugees, and I picked up Philoctetes again, because when we are at these difficult moments in our life, we turn to myth, don't we? Because myth is a great medicine. And... I was so nervous orientating a room with the wounded, the maimed, the uh, mentally ill, these army refugees, no, these army veterans. And I realized they really loved this play. So I called Kay and I said to them, would you come in? And I think there's something happening with Philoctetes now, it feels really live. And Kay and I spent an evening in a very small room with these um, ex-soldiers wor working through the play and seeing how it resonated, not just for them, but for Kay speaking for them and myself. And Kay then went away, did a version, and we've worked on the version for a few years. And uh, it's so thrilling because... Sometimes I think you attract the play to you, you need to help you process what's happening collectively in terms of the title of your conference and individually. In fact, the dialectic between those two things is very alive in culture. So that's my story. Um, I guess for you, Kay, you just fielded a call from me saying Sophocles, which who I'm sure you loved already, but this weird play, Philoctetes. Yeah, I'd never uh, encountered it before. The first time I heard it, the first time I read it was when I heard it read by the um, the ex-military personnel in this room. And it was, um, it was an incredible experience for me. And then I have then had this very close relationship with it where I've been wrestling with um, how to translate the concerns of these characters into concerns that have some relevance or some resonance in a contemporary setting um, while trying to stay true to what felt like the thrust of the story. And um, I, I was swallowed by Philoctetes completely. I fell in love with this character because I feel like in my own life, I've known lots of people who I could find Philoctetes in and in myself as well. So I, I feel really lucky to have the opportunity to work with Ian on this, who's somebody that I trust deeply and have known a long time. And I trust his creativity and his eye, but also his friendship. So it feels like um, this particular moment that could be very scary for a, a writer, you know, 
taking on something as huge and as important as a Sophocles play doesn't feel intimidating or anything. It just, it feels um, joyous and kind of revelatory. And I'm really excited about what we've done with the chorus and what we've done with the characters and how Neoptolemus has come to life. And I, in my head right now, at the beginning of the rehearsal process, we go into rehearsal in about three days. Um, I'm carrying all of the drafts. It's been through so many drafts, which mm -hmm. is incredible. It's so cool that we had enough time for me to write, write it wrong so many times. It's just such a hugely important part of the process that there was time to get things wrong. And so now as we go into rehearsal and I think about it actually being something that people are gonna see and witness, I just feel so um, excited for what this story, this very, very old story about um, exclusion, isolation, wound, like health, healing. At this time, coming out of what we've all just been through, our own private lockdowns, isolation, woundedness, our very close proximity to illness and the fragility of our own, of our own bodies and also the entire ecosystem that was apparently sustaining us. It just feels like the perfect time to have this story told actually. That's, that's what I have to say about that. I, I find that very interesting, um, the last few sentences, um, because actually Philoctetes is about um, a person who has been segregated. Hmm? And I find that um, extremely, that's a, an extremely topical narrative. So would you say that um, this is a kind of, um, um, it's important for, 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 for this piece and also for, um, for your production, Ian? Yeah, I think myths pulse under the cognitive and the ritual with ancient archetypal meaning. And for me, the ritual of something that we've gone through individually in terms of that segregation, to use your word, to create a public ritual in the biggest theatre in England, the Olivier at the National Theatre, feels like a really dynamic, thrilling gesture. And um, how accessible this play is, because an impediment for me with some of the Greek plays is when the gods are very strong or fate sits over the play, I start to tune out because I think, OK, well, it was preordained or this God is wreaking their vengeance. Whereas the plays that I really love, Electra, Antigone and uh, Philoctetes, feel so much about our responsibility, our interconnectedness, who we are now. And they are balm and they are medicine at the difficult times. So um, certainly in my production or our production, because we'll make it together, I hope that the collective act of um, thousands of people coming together at the time we've been living in will be very, very meaningful. Yeah, and I think that it will be important. There will be a resonance to the the isolation of this of this person stranded in his cave but it, it isn't the case that I willingly pulled that out of the myth to try and make that resonance um, more apparent than it already will be it, it is the case that whatever is happening privately in people's lives and socially in the bigger frameworks of our lives comes into the room with the audience and gives text its meaning like so I was writing this way before Covid and um, if it went on at a different time it would have a different kind of resonance it's just it's quite exciting for me to feel like um, this is the right time for this play because suddenly there's this other element to it which is that it's about emergence from 
isolation as Philip Tease is trying to go back into the world and all of the um, drama that unfolds in the play around, I want to get back into the world, you know. When you write an album and you have to feel your way into that person in that flat or that person on the pavement, or you write from inside Theresius or whatever, you do that so well. And then what's the process been like feeling yourself into not just Philoctetes, into Neoptolemus and Odysseus, and we'll come to the chorus later, how you've had to sort of birth them from your own underbelly. Has that been challenging? Has that been rewarding? It's been amazing. <laughs> it's such a useless <laughs> word, sorry, it's such an undescriptive word, but the at first I was quite tightly bound by the original text and I mean it's a perfectly written play, it's perfect, it's lasted 3,000 years, it, it, you know, the exchanges that they have are perfect and for me to then find my way into it to kind of muscle in on dialogue that has been serving its purpose so successfully, it was hard for me to give myself permission to reimagine these characters, but it was only when they became real for me, outside of how Sophocles had written them, that it began to feel like something exciting um, or something worth doing or something that I could actually yeah, feel my way into. Odysseus, I, he he was the first one that came that came to life, I think, because uh, you're so used to reading him in a certain way, you're so used to hearing about him in a certain way, and I just felt I felt him talking to me in a different way. I felt his this was his moment of weakness and tiredness and um, despair, and that felt more real to me when I was thinking about the situation of how it would really be to have left your friend for 10 years on an island and then to have to come back and face that and try and drag this person out of the hole you left them in. I just like, it, that's what I mean about it being so at odds with the Greek tragic sensibility or the characters in the play, what they would have meant to the audience. This is the thing that I found most challenging, not so much the characterization. Once I was able to set myself free from, um, the perfection of the original and just think about these characters as if they were as if it was my my characters as if i was telling the story for my own reasons that was okay but it was like like you say ian about the gods resolving things it's not something that contemporary audiences can are really moved by that there has to be another way um to have to create the same effect. And that's what's been interesting. Like, is it possible to reinvest these characters with, um, uh, like, conflict that feels more applicable, but that, with the I, that we get the same effect that a Greek audience would be having from Neoptolemus having a conflict about bravery, loyalty, or honor, or like, what, what is that for a young person now? For an, for an 18 year old, I imagine the autonomous as being about that old. He's young, it's his first time out, he's 18, 19, and he's, he doesn't want to lie. But what that would have meant to a, an audience seeing this war orphan having this conflict doesn't mean the same thing to us. But the characters as real, the conflicts as real, the stakes are as high, I just had to find a different way, um, a different way in. Yeah. Is it something you found in, in words, in poetry? I mean, it's a play about pain and trauma and injury, everything you said about revenge and despair. Is it something you, you found through words or in situations or both? Yeah, I mean, it's all in the situation. It's like, you know, there is a man in a cave on an island and he's wounded and there's a young soldier that needs to persuade this dangerous man to do this thing that he doesn't want to do. He, 
he needs to deceive and trick and he's green he's young he doesn't he doesn't have the gift of the gab like Odysseus and he's being manipulated or guided by this older soldier who doesn't really have his best interests at heart and there's love between all of them and there's a lot of pain at the at the roots of it so it's all there it's, it's all there but I just had to find a way of opening it up you know even the way you say that and Estelle and Silke you'll know more than us the fact that Sophocles at the end of his life doesn't set a play by the palace gates the cosmology of this play an island a cave and the strange ambiguity of a cave which is part womb part tomb um, we all need a cave to retreat to but it can also be a cell and then as well as the cave there's the island and just it feels to me so expressive it's a bit like when Shakespeare at the end of his life writes the Tempest similarly on an island I'm sure Shakespeare had read Philoctetes um, why do you think Sophocles is going away from that imprint of where most Greek plays take place Silka or Estelle That's a really good question, Ian. Thank you so much for that. I, I have no idea. I, uh, honestly, I haven't thought about it, but that's very, very inspiring. Estelle, what about you? <laughs> I'd say that Greek tragedy is always about alterity. And suddenly alterity is not. Um, so it's always, you know, choruses of women, slaves, um, strangers, foreigners. And suddenly it's a chorus of soldiers, it's citizens. So it's not us for it's not foreign enough. So if you want to still be tragic and talk about alterity, you need another place. That will be the point I would make, dramaturgically speaking. Authority. Alterity, sorry. Alterity. Uh, what does that mean, alterity? Um between um being different, uh, you know, um, yeah, being <laughs> otherness. I mean otherness. Ah. Great. Yeah. yeah. We, we're not so up with the fantastic academic lingo. And that's a good word, though. I, I like learning new words each day. Alterity. Maybe it's not an English word and I'm making that up. Um, I like it. I don't care. Um, that might be a good cue because an early conversation Kay and I would have had is, OK, there were these challenges with the Greek plays. What do you do about the gods? And, you know, in the original, Heracles comes down, doesn't he, and sorts it all out. And, um, and what do you do about the chorus? And um, Kay went away on holiday. And I was thinking, well, I hope this is a good idea. Um, Kay, Philoctetes, Sophocles. And she came back and she looked radiant and said, I've had this idea about the chorus. So rather than um, a chorus of sailors, in Kay's play, they've created a different kind of um, chorus, which you should you should talk about that, Kay, maybe like how that came to you. Yeah. Um, yeah, my chorus are not soldiers. They're the inhabitants of the island. And um, they're, they're a group of women that live hand to mouth. Um, in an encampment that they've built themselves. And they are the survivors to Philoctetes victim, you know? So where Philoctetes is in his cave and screaming in agony and blaming the world, the chorus are surviving the traumas of their lives and getting on with making the bread, you know, planting the, you know, getting what crops they can, looking after things. And uh, yeah, I was away, I went away, I had a gig in, in Sri Lanka at a literary festival. I'd never been to that part of the world before. And I managed to get a couple of weeks off touring just to, to stay there and write. I, I knew I had this play to work on. And I just got this very simple um, shack in a fisherman's village in, um, not that far from where the literary festival was, a couple of hours. And just was in this village, had a couple of weeks to write. And my partner 
was just going out and just hanging out with the people in the village, just met this crew of women that were just like the women that lived in the village and just became friends and was just hanging out with them. And uh, the men in this village were, had been hit pretty hard by a couple of things. Their generations of families had been fishermen and then these tsunamis had come and suddenly the next generation were afraid of the sea. And also there was, so there was high unemployment because of that. Also the fishing industry was not what it used to be. And um, they couldn't quite make the same living that they used to be able to make. Also like because of the tourism and stuff that, that, that had happened to the island, lots of things had changed. People had been using dynamite to fish and it had destroyed the coral. Anyway. There was a lot of kind of despondency and drunkenness and trouble in the men and the women were just getting on with everything. They were just getting on with it. They were just keeping everything going. They were a pretty hardcore bunch of women and me meeting them after a day of writing Philoctetes, then going to meet and just chill and just like, or some would come to the house and we'd just hang out. Suddenly I realized, I realized that this was, it was these, this is the chorus. This was the island and this was the chorus. So um, some of the lines in the chorus come directly from those women that I met in Sri Lanka, like a direct line. So I need to credit them, honor them and give them a royalty probably at some point. But the, um, the chorus then, as is often the case, an idea starts you, you carry an, I carry an idea around with me and whatever I'm going through or experiencing feeds into it. And so the chorus began that way. And then obviously as the drafts progress and as I'm back in the UK, the chorus becomes something else. They become this kind of mythological idea of survival. And the island that I was setting my play on is now, it's many islands, it's lots of things. Um, uh, so, oh wait, hold on, sorry, sorry. My computer just did something weird. That's okay. Um, I'm wondering, Ian, how you're, you're imagining the work with the chorus, because I, I saw your performance of Electra at the Old Vic in, in 2014, and I remember being completely amazed by um, the powerful circulation of Electra's sufferings among, among the members of the chorus. But mm. uh, from what Kay just said about the chorus in the play, I'm just wondering if, you, if you're thinking about a work like that and what will be the relationship between uh, the main characters and the chorus in Paradise? Is the dramaturgy very different? What's um, yeah. your thought about that? Yeah. And when we think about the body, are the bodies of the chorus a barometer for what is happening in the main line of action? And how invested are they as guides, provocateurs, heckling forces or what in relationship to that main drama and I think what Kay's done which is really exciting is she's positioned is, is what Kay's done is they've positioned the chorus mm -hmm. as citizens who survive as opposed to a binary of heroism and grievance so the soldiers are immersed in the kind of excuse my language, head fuck of pressure to be masculine, heroic, um, strong. And the, and the other side of that is enormous rage and grievance and victimhood. Uh, quietly connected to the earth, going about their business of the chorus, but they're not quiet in the play, they're active. And um, in answer to your question, um, I hope they feel fully entwined in the world and a really dynamic force to make us think about the performance of gender, particularly amongst Philoctetes and Neoptolemus and Odysseus, uh, who are so bound by their, um, the, the imprisonment of masculinity. Um, and there was a moment when we were workshopping the play, um, Estelle, where um, there was this backdrop of nine women and three men were acting their hearts out in the middle of this workshop. And uh, Kay, I think, felt quite queasy about that gender divide. And just speaking for you, Kay, um, 
suggested that we should explore the three soldiers being played by women as well. So that in a way, watching an actress perform a male soldier performing masculinity felt more vivid and transparent than seeing three male actors going at it. So suddenly now we've got um, a company of 12 women doing this play um, written by Sophocles through the, pr the, the, the prism of, of Kay's amazing lens. I did look up the word uh, alterity. It is a, an English word, the state of being otherness. It's from Latin, love it. I thought that it was um, important to have the citizens of the island or the, the residents of this island speaking out rather than just this action just coming, you know, this great old place um, arriving on this stage and having, you know, doing its thing. I just thought it was, it was kind of inexcusable to not have the residents of this place where this where this action is taking place also be acknowledged as as being there so and i think in i think it's going to be something that people i think the, the the original function of the chorus to act as like a as i understand it in my limited um under, like classical understanding as far as i'm aware the, the function of the chorus was to kind of act as as a like a safe space between the audience and the action of the play, like a way for the audience to hear their own thoughts said back at them, a way to invite the audience to, um, to rouse them, to like be this kind of conduit between the action and the feeling in the crowd. And I think in that sense, I think the chorus does that. Also the chorus has rhythm and rhythmic parts and there's musicality in the language, which I know there was in, in the ancient theatre. So I'm hopeful that they will fulfill the function that, um, that Sophocles would recognise as being the function of the chorus. But I don't know. Where does the play Silka, Estelle, sit from your perspective, Philoctetes? I mean, it's not one of the key ancient classical text, is it? It's one of the more rarefied. Um, where does it sit in your consciousness? Um, so for me, it's um, the experience, like myself, I have of um, when Christian Scarati staged it in France and I was just 20 and it was Laurent Terzieff's last yeah. role in front, it's, a, it's an amazing actor. And he couldn't eat at that point. So he was very, very thin and very, very sick. Yes. And it was it was completely amazing just because Laurent Terzieff was the center of the play. But I think that what Skiaritis didn't understood, what didn't understand was uh, the chorus at that point. So I, I like the idea of having the chorus back in this play. But if I, I look at it more generally, I'd say that, um, you're right, Philoctetes is not major because it's not been staged a lot, but it's just because, um, I don't know why, but I'd say it's not staged a lot, so it's not staged a lot. Like it's it's like, um, if if you start staging it, maybe other people will. So it's, it's, it's gonna change because of that. That's my main point and um, and I guess it's also because of um, the difficulty of having this um, male cast, like because there are no women in in Philoctetes and what people really like about ancient tragedies is usually to have uh, the feminine character mm -hmm. as main characters. Interesting. Silka? How, about, how about you, Silka? Honestly, what I wanted to say, um, um, maybe it, it goes a bit beyond, um, because what I liked very much um, is that you, I, Ian, uh, you were talking about the gaze, more or less, and I was asking myself if so. Um, Philoctetes is not only about suffering pain, but also about witnessing pain. Mm. Is this 
a central issue for uh, or was is has that been a central issue for you both of you yeah i mean both philoctetes as a war veteran who's seen so much death um and odysseus are saturated with that trauma and we live in a society don't we where with a click of a switch we can probably watch someone you know being beheaded or um, suffering enormous trauma and the viral collective notion of that trauma and what we do with it with our access to each other is major plus we live at in an age of real grievance where politics has become more adversarial, where social media is the equivalent of um, the stocks and shaming and scapegoating. But you've got Sophocles working it out with these three characters, you know, one of the first three character plays, I'm told, play with subtext, and it feels so modern and um, such a lucid, song to sing um given what we're going through and processing in our collectivity um so i feel really excited talking to you actually because um it's foregrounding what feels really urgent um can i ask you both about um Philoctetes body how do you picture it mm. Yeah, I mean, the par I, I always like, for me, the, par the paradoxes. So when you describe that French actor, who, um, he was HIV positive, wasn't he? And it was like an incredibly powerful- And it was also la the last stage of a cancer. I oh, right, That's okay, I'm it. thinking of a different production that uh, maybe um, Helen told me about. Um, I like the- the, the paradox of the virility and potency of Philoctetes, that he's got this, he's a war machine, yet he's also a tramp. He's also um, this outcast. So I think the body needs the patina of um, muscularity and ravage. And if you can find that in the actor, so um, the body is very present with its wounded quality, but also the threat, then I think you've got something really interesting because you want the, the, the kind of, um, the contradiction in each character. Um, Kay talked about Odysseus, who on the one hand is the most articulate, eloquent of all the Greeks, yet um, he is fatigued and desperate. And then you've got this emerging body of Neoptolemus, who's so attractive and young and seemingly committed to a kind of moral clarity, but ends up a brutal man. So I love the dance of these bodies and what Kay's put around them with this, this um, chorus of um, nine women. What do you feel about Philoctetes' body? Um, I, I see Philoctetes um, as being quite a formidable presence. I don't see him as a... I don't see his wound as being uh, debilitating, even though it is. Uh, the thing that um, speaks loudest to me is um, is the mental trauma, is the wound of the wound in his character. That's the thing that he's battling with. Um, I don't. For me, it's not a play um, about the phys his the physicality of his leg. Like it's there. Obviously, he's he has he's wounded. He is a wounded soldier, and he has this wound on his leg. But um, his 
his wound in my reading of it is his if it, his desire for vengeance and his inability to take responsibility for where he's at and his like just his his inability to let go and heal yeah. so that may be quite a divisive um response to philoctetes but that's that's just how it hit me yeah. i love that because everybody can identify with that and we all have a shadow self that might be full of self-pity grievance rage um and then we have to work out how we hopefully commit to responsibility and community and um how amazing that at the end of his life sophocles he was a general we're told aren't we in the pathology is that what they call it like how we know about the um biology of the, not the, bi the biography of these people uh, and i i hear that he built a shrine in his garden for sort of peace and healing and um i don't know i just find it so moving that somehow this play survived and i know that so many plays didn't but i kind of feel like well a lot of the good ones really did it was really it's been an incredible experience for me to to dive so deeply into characters, but to have the framework already so perfectly constructed for, for a writer, for a playwright, for a poet, the, the possibility for enjoying the process is so much bigger because there is this like framework, which is this plot and you, you, need, you just know that whatever um, developments you wanna make or changes or you come back to this, the, these cogs, these turning cogs that already exist. And it's been so enjoyable to get my teeth into something um, that I can rely on so much that I don't, it doesn't come, I don't have to try and make it all add up. It already adds up, you know? And it's, it's been a beautiful excursion into the essential, the essentials of character and storytelling. And just, it's, really been an amazing amazing experience and it hasn't even begun yet you know it starts it starts in a few days i just i could the, the all the different drafts even just talking to you guys about philoctetes and it brings it brings to mind times when i spoke to helen eastman who's the classicist who um i think you all know probably um she was amazing and she did the literal translation and i really remember her the the translation that she it did you know it was so literal that it wouldn't say island it would say sea surrounded land because that's how it would have been said in the greek and it just blew my mind that like and for the first three drafts i was just spinning i didn't even know how to land because it was there was all this talk about the the sound i i spoke to people that actually could speak <laughs> ancient Greek and there just there was just this sound of like, kah, 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 like in my ears of like well what am I going to phonetically match the ancient Greek to try and create the right kind of motor and for a long time I just felt like I was just not I hadn't landed in it but uh, and um, now I feel so deeply rooted in this world that we've created and these characters feel so real to me and Philoctetes he my Philoctetes it's people that I know and love, like people, damaged people that I, I have, I carry around. Like, <laughs> and so as soon as I started to realize the resonances between that, between the character of Philip Titis and these people, then suddenly I realized <sighs> these very, very old stories have got so much to teach us about, you know, where we're at. It's so, it's so important, powerful. Resonant. You did, uh, that's beautiful. You did a um, evening class, didn't you? When you were struggling to be a, I don't know, a rapper or whatever in classical studies at Goldsmiths when yeah. you were like 20 or something. So something in you some, was thinking, actually I need to go here to the ancients. And then of course we know how they've infused your poetry and brand new ancients. So it's a lovely journey, sort of drawing from that scene. 
Yeah, I'm very lucky to have to have met you, Ian Rickson, who gave me the, the chance to delve into this play. Like, whoo! I don't. Need, I feel like it's just an obvious choice when when you think about that. But don't you feel, um, Estelle and Silka, like the kingdom of myth and classical studies and is a great therapeutic zone. It attracts so many people that need to really work out big things to do with character and soul. And sometimes people who've suffered real loss gravitate to that world because it allows you to um, emit a frequency that's very deep and uh, cathartic. Hmm. Yeah, that brings me to a question um, that maybe it's maybe it's a bit banal, but I would like to know what uh, what you're thinking about it. So according to Aristotle, Greek tragedy is all about pity, compassion and fear. Yeah. And I was wondering, I don't know, because um, I'm coming from a, from the background of German speaking um, theater studies. Yeah. Um, so in, in, in Germany and in Austria, we are talking about a so-called post-traumatic period. Yeah. And um, so in Germany, um, these, let's say, effects or categories mm. nowadays at theater are like, um, I don't know, I would, I would like to call them taboo. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what about compassion, pity, and fear um, within your work? Do yeah. these um, kind of phenomena, effects, factors still matter? And what about the audience? There's a lot of questions in there, Silka. Um, I mean, yes, I mean, you, you come from the auteur culture in European theatre, particularly Germany and Austria, where the director is the primary artist and uh, there's maybe no such thing as character and the writer is even uh, Jelinek is often quite marginal uh, and um, amazing work can come from those cultures. Um, for me, K and Sophocles are the primary artist and my job is to try and mine as deeply as I can what they're both doing. And going back to your Aristotle quote, pity and fear, it's so pure to me. Pity that you might make a thousand people think, I feel for Philoctetes, I actually feel for Odysseus. No, I feel for the chorus. You know, so you have empathetic engagement, however old fashioned that might seem to a trendy Austrian. Uh, and then fear, you know, we do plays to terrify the audience about what might be coming and to make us all stop certain weather fronts that could be on the horizon. And certainly in Philoctetes, the cycle of violence and what that does to the planet and to the body is, is amazing. So yes, I admire post-dramatic theater. I respect so many of those participants. I love seeing that work, but for me, there's nothing better and more rousing than, um, that original gesture uh, of pity and fear and what a play is for and the ritualistic, um, cathartic offering of a play. Um, and I hope I didn't get too evangelical there. I, I think that was a really interesting question and really well put in, but the, it makes me think about pity, compassion and fear and wh where they feature in this play that we've made that I've written um it's basically that is what the, the this is what the play is about these are the things the play is about I I often talk about it as being in terms of um grievance um victimhood versus survival that this is how I've come to understand it but actually pity compassion and fear is pretty much on the nose what we're dealing with um Neoptolemus is full of fear Odysseus is full of fear. Philoctetes is full of fear. They and uh, and then I suppose we have pity for Philoctetes. Philoctetes has this weird pity for Neoptolemus, and then the chorus, who might be you might be used to feeling kind of piteous feelings towards, are actually like extremely courageous in this play. 
And I think you feel compassion. I would hope you feel compassion. So I, I, I love it when um, you're given a lens from an ancient mind to view something that you're still making up and it just completely um, focuses uh, what you were looking at. What do you feel, Estelle, about that uh, pity and fear um, offering from Aristotle and the purpose of it in theatre now? I think it's a literary theory, much more than a theatrical experience at first. But um, what I, and, and to answer your previous question, Ian, it's um, um, what Greek tragedy has to uh, bring to us right now. It's what you said about ritualism. I think it's um, the, the balance and um, <clears throat> It's kind of um, a res respiration, like inhalation and expiration between the chorus and the character. It's something going big and going small again. So I, I like this image of um, uh, the way it circulates between the chorus and the characters. And I think that's where sits the main feeling and the main rituals in, in Greek tragedy. And yeah, and if you, if you take that metaphor on, can we breathe the same air, the inspiration and the exhalation? And how do we gather now? And what are the protocols to gather large numbers of people? And who wants to come? And what will the play sing like in that environment? Really interesting questions. Um, I'm really sorry to interrupt. I have to, I have to go. Fantastic. Been very fine. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kay, for joining. It was amazing to talk to you to have this opportunity. Yeah, like it was a real pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank uh, you. See you later. Nice one, Kay. Um, yeah. yeah, I was just um, wondering during the last um, um, exchanges, um, I was just wondering um, about, I, I've read somewhere that the set will be a wasteland designed by Kay Smith. Ray Smith, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's on the National Theatre's website. Okay. And I was wondering um, what if, if you're thinking about images of violence and destruction, or if it's just a word that has been put there. Oh. I think we have to gather a whole series of people into a space. And if that space is swerved too much by the director and the designer into apocalypse and destruction, can you allow the play to speak and have its own air if you push it too far? So my inclination has been to try and create as much an elemental world as possible with um, earth, wood, fire, water so that the image systems in the play to do with those things and to do with who we are biochemically in between each other and our relationship to the land uh, to allow those to really resonate so um, there is some destruction insofar as it is a kind of tsunami war-torn island but there's an encampment for the chorus and Philoctetes has his cave. And um, it's very simple. It's also in the round, which is a real challenge with Greek plays, as you know, because particularly with a chorus, how do you stage <laughs> um, scenes with people in the way, etc. cetera. So um, I have to be really skillful maneuvering an audience through that landscape. But um, I guess, if you think about Epidavros and you think about the original um, theatre, it was very spare and very simple. It didn't have a lot of production and auteurism mediating how the play worked. Essentially, the plays were corporeal and verbal. And I think that's what they need. They need amazing actors and they need a fantastic environment. Whether they need a lot of set or destruction, I'm not sure.
Thank you. Um, I think I'm I'm just going to ask a, a final question because it's going to be almost an hour already. Okay. Um, if you can if you can talk about it, maybe you don't want to. But what what will be the first thing you're going to do starting rehearsals on Monday? Like what what do you want to say to the act actresses at first to start yeah. the final process? I can be completely honest about this, Estelle, because the last few days. I have been negotiating with the National to try and find conditions that allow us to rehearse without masks, to allow somebody to touch somebody else, to not have a phalanx of people policing our work. But I also understand that certain conditions need to be in place to allow everybody to be safe and for um, germs not to be passed on. So the first thing I was offered was for the COVID officer to come and make a speech about hand sanitizer and masks. And I have obviously stopped that because I want to feel like the coming together of 12 actors after, for many of them, not really working for a year on this play is a amazing heroic opportunity. Then I was thinking as we were talking, and that's why it's nice to do these talks, that whatever the restrictions and whatever the protocols around COVID-19, perhaps we should use all of those restrictions to be as brave and as messy and as courageous as we can. Um, and to create a kind of energy on stage that is defiant and disturbing and beautiful and rousing. And I wondered whether there's something about that as a first offering that might empower the actors rather than them feel reduced and frightened by, well, you have to sit over there, we can't, have, we, you have to sit there, et cetera, et cetera, prohibitions. Because sometimes if you have restrictions, say like, if Estelle, if you and I were meeting and we had to stay two metres apart, um, there might be a way you and I could contact each other that could be really charged and interesting that actually we just nuzzled up, nuzzled up to each other. It might be less dramatic. So I want to work within these parameters and try and use it to make the play feel really vivid in a big space.